Welcome to Overcoming Medical Hair Loss Summit. My name is Valerie Fuentes. I'm your host, and today I am with Dr. Natasha Mesinkoska. She's the Chief Scientific Officer of the National Alopecia Riata Foundation. Thank you, Natasha, so much for accepting my invitation. I'm super excited to have you here today with us. Valerie, thanks for having me. What a great way to spend an evening. Yes. So I want to know, how did you get into this area of research? What attracted you to study this? So I always tell this story, how I come from part of the world where we like to grow hair on all sorts of part of the body, not only on the hair. So I grew up trying to pluck it, wax it, and try to remove it. And then now at adult age, I try to grow it. So totally the opposite. When I was training in Cleveland Clinic as a dermatologist, I had the biggest honor to learn with Dr. Wilma Burkfeld, who's one of the staples in hair conditions. And um, she believed in me enough, um, gave me a lot of research opportunities and connected me with the National Alopecia Areata Foundation. I think at the first conference I went to, I just fell in love with the community. I fell in love with the people and that was it. I felt like this is where I can make a difference, grow and gave me a purpose for life. Yeah. And that's actually how I feel right now. It took me a long time to feel comfortable with it, but now that I know about NAF and you know the community, right? Because at the beginning, I didn't even know all these people existed that had a lapisha just like me. Now, all I want to do is get involved with the community. All I want to do is serve the community. So I can totally relate with what you're saying. Um, so part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because for me, <laughs> In my own personal journey, I was diagnosed over a decade ago, and it was kind of like, okay, so I went to one doctor, I found out I had alopecia, complete denial, hated it, no, there is no way I have it, went to another doctor, went to another doctor, another doctor, different specialists, other things, until I finally was like, okay, got it, I do have this. But back then, 10 years ago, there was no cure, that was it. Right, he was right. like, alopecia, goodbye, have a nice day, deal with it. And I dealt with it, <laughs> not in the best way. But now, so now I'm better, now I accept it, now I embrace it. But I'm, I want to know, it's been over 10 years. So what has happened in research? Do we, are, are there any progress? Of what's happening in the research world? Well, the past decade has, in a way, brought a lot of changes. I think the thing you're voicing, like the experience you have, it's not just your own, right? Um, so think about it. Alopecia areata affects about 2% of the population, we think. And the numbers are comparable, maybe a little bit less than psoriasis. And then you see all these commercials on TV for psoriasis, but nothing for alopecia. And the truth is that all these years... Um, except maybe intralesional injections, there's no, not one medication that's specifically approved to treat alopecia areata. I think what really started happening probably more than a decade ago is we started understanding the mechanisms. Okay, this is not something we can necessarily knock and it's not going to come back. Understand mm -hmm. the nature, understand the immunology. We're still learning about it, trying to figure out like what's genes, what are etiologies, et cetera. But we pretty much have... Um, realize a couple of connections genetically and then with the immune system and then some of them with allergies and those are in a way the the new routes the new venues that people are exploring to make medications mm -hmm. the biggest breakthrough has been a family of medications called jack j-a-k inhibitors so mm -hmm. they're pills that you take by mouth once or twice daily, at least the ones that are being studied right now. And what they do is they lower some of the parts of the immune system that are active and we think are responsible in some of that attack on the hair that makes the hair fall out and doesn't let it come back. Okay. So when you block them, that's what they're called inhibitors, the hair can progress and grow. Mm -hmm. The great thing about these medications is that they're actually been studied already in conditions like psoriasis, arthritis, and they're approved from them. We're also trying them in eczema. The, the stomach doctors are trying them in some of the inflammatory bowel uh, conditions. So they're being studied for all sorts of things. So we're understanding more about their safety and things that we worry about, right? Because mm -hmm. the biggest thing about anyone that has alopecia areata is, on average, it's a young person. 
right? It affects us pretty early in life. And you have to make a trade-off or you have to decide, how can I treat this without hurting myself in the long run? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, how long are, do you have to treat yourself for it? Yep. For as far as we understand, these new medications are really good at growing hair. Even when people have had alopecia universalis, wow. several of them are being in trials, right? So people are able to get their eyelashes, their eyebrows, um, their scalp back. They, the numbers for which we quote now for the studies are about that they work in about 70% of patients. So we say two thirds to three quarters, and they have a pretty solid response. Um, but the way we understand them is you kind of have to take them. And then if you stop in a little bit of time, the hair will fall out again. So we're trying to figure out, um, how much to use so you don't have to take too much, how long you have to use it. A lot out there that we still have to figure out, but a lot of happy patients walking around too with sets of hair without trouble. So what's the actual relationship of alopecia with allergies? Because you said it's an allergy medication. So what's the relationship? So, so this one is more the immune system. There's another one that's actually specific for allergies, and I'll mention a little bit of the, about that one too. The connection with allergy and alopecia areata is there's certain things that we call, it's a, it's a morbid word because we say comorbidities as doctors in medicine, but that means that certain like conditions go together. So for example, um, if you have alopecia areata, about, depending on which part of the world and what population looked at, but about one third to one half of patients will also have eczema. So I don't know if you're an eczema baby, right? <laughs> so a lot of us are eczema babies. So, um, you know, that's, so we're trying to figure out what flares your, egg, your eczema and your allergy. Does that flare your alopecia? So there's a doctor in Philadelphia who actually studies kids with alopecia. Dr. Costello Socio is, is her name, and she's at the children's. She's amazing. So she actually looked at some of the patterns in the year, and she realized that in the spring and in the fall is when we alopecians tend to flare, right? So I always I remember like the residency when I was learning about alopecia areata, I was like, why is it? And I think in a way we assumed, okay, in the spring it's allergies or maybe it's stress of exams and in the fall stress of going back to school. But what she demonstrated and um, we have similar data from some other countries is that those are the times that actually your eczema flares the most too. So that's one of the links we're trying to address. Um, Dr. Emma Gutman, who's in Mount Sinai, she um, has trials with a medication called Dupixin. It's a little mm -hmm. shot that people give themselves twice a month, and it's not immunosuppressive. You don't need any labs, and it can work in certain patients and get the hair back and control the eczema. So between all these medications, we're trying to figure out, like, oh, is this going to work for one group? Is this going to work for another group? And if you don't want to take medications, what else can we do for you? Right. So how is all this research funded? Because I also wonder, you know, like if if anybody's doing anything, how are how are they being funded? So the initial studies that kind of led to these pathways, I have to tell you, were really funded by the National Alopecia Areata Foundation and the grants they were given out yeah. to people that were really dedicated, such as Angela Cristiano in New York, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Hordinsky, Dr. Norris, like all these big names that you ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, who studied genetic pathways. And then once some of the pathways were delineated and some of the medications were tried, um, mm -hmm. then the, com the pharmaceutical companies became interested because they have these medications and they're using them for other conditions. So they're on their shelf. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have the medicine, just the interest in the population. So I think the National Alopecia Areata Foundation has been essential in trying to, and that's, how, that's what happened when I joined the organization. And my job was really to try to connect and entice the pharmaceutical companies and connect them with the scientists and connect them with the community. So I always say like my job is to be a connector, the translator, like just to see like, okay, if there's a need and what do things mean? And we don't want to really take a medicine every day, but if we have to take it, can it not hurt people? You know, one of those things. Right. And the reason why I ask is because I feel like all of this, you know, it's amazing and I'm so glad to hear that it's happening, but at the same time, I don't know that it will ever be approved by insurance, right? So what my, my thing is like, what's the connection between the research and, and the pharmaceuticals? And at, at what point is it gonna become available to us? 
Because right, it's so one of, you find it and then you have it, but like how exactly. do you make it available? So here's the thing that right now there's two medications out there that are approved and one of them, um, tofacitinib, we were able to give to patients on some of the uh, patient um, kind of assistance programs, but then they stopped. So there are two medications out there, um, tofacitinib, raxolitinib, that potentially can work, and another one, pericitinib. But what happens is once the big, the companies invest who have to invest millions of dollars tens and then more to get these medications to market they have you know lawyers they have economists they have people that have to follow all those um government the fda the federal drug administration kind of rules and establish these things but um i feel that you know nobody will waste their time if they're not going to be able to get stuff because they know if this is a special medication that people will have to take and have to take longer, they have to figure out a way to get it to, to, to the people that need it. So I think they are the ones, and National Apicia Ariata Foundation is trying to, in a way, get all these things to the FDA that will show that this, the patients really need it. So the grassroots efforts on our end have really been to show that it's, Alopecia Ariata is a medical we, we wrote an article that said Alopecia Ariata is a medical disease model that are, uh, around the whole vitiligo concept Um, because they did something like that previously, just to show to the government, to the insurance, to the other doctors that this is important and it does matter and affects the hair, but not just the hair. And, you know, just to to make it out there. And people don't like it when we call it a disease and I'm always a condition because I don't like to say the word disease, but we have to kind of put it out there in order to get it covered. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's a huge distinction because I even don't like that word. I don't. If you, if you, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Actually, um, yeah, part of the reason that I haven't done this earlier is because I didn't want to focus on the problem because I don't want to talk about my hair loss as a problem. And I didn't know how to approach this without being negative and without being without saying, okay, let's fix this problem, right? Because I don't want to be sick and I don't want people to look at me as I'm sick because I don't feel sick. I have alopecia, but I don't feel like a sick person with a disease right so I didn't want to come about it like this but I totally see what you're saying that if you don't approach it that way then nobody nobody thinks that it's important right and that's you know uh, yeah I think for yeah, everybody I, that has something chronic like whether it's alopecia areata, whether it's psoriasis whether it's thyroid whether it's diabetes you know um there's a whole process when you're like oh, do I really am I really gonna have this for a lot like for life and then you go after the why me and you know people are like well you eat you gotta eat healthy and you're not sleeping enough and you're like man you know people that have the most rambunctious lives and nothing ever happens to them so i think we just gotta take some of that guilt off of us and um we have a very good mask that we put on and we try to be like nothing bugs us and it doesn't affect us but i i think when when some of those things come off when some of those layers come off we just gotta we, we gotta make other people see it that it's we right. are tough it's, but we're tough it's, for a reason it's 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 part of the advocating right like um i see what you're saying i mean now now i see the other side right because at the beginning i didn't want to talk about it as a negative thing but now as i'm talking to you about it and as i'm doing this interviews and i'm doing the summit i also realize that if we don't raise awareness as in hey guess what this is more than just hair right because for insurance companies you're like oh it's just because it's, it's a cosmetic thing no it's not a cosmetic thing when you lose your hair you also affect your entire being your psychological being your relationships your family so no it's not cosmetic <laughs> it's so like absolutely one, really cosmetic so one interesting thing came out of um actually from a couple of different parts of the world, like showing that there's a relationship between alopecia areata and depression okay. and anxiety. And we always thought like, you know, like the hair falls out, you're not feeling right about it. So of course, but actually it was shown to be both ways. Yeah. Meaning people that have depression or have anxiety are more prone to it. And we're learning more about like anxiety and depression. And we realize they're also associated with inflammation. And my whole point is, you know, whenever there's any kind of inflammation, even if it's low grade here in the skin, or even if it's eczema, it does take energy to keep all that immunity kind of 
And now um, we're doing a little bit of, like we're getting more into the science of aging. There's this whole process of inflammaging, like how like inflammation ages you more. Like, so we're understanding more and more. So my whole point is, no matter which way we feel, we have to figure out what else is going on. Not to label anyone any different because we know. Um, life-wise, it shouldn't affect shorter lifespan or anything like that. But is your life as easy as it could be? Yes. Like, is that eczema that you have taking a toll? Or mm -hmm. a lot of alopecia mm -hmm. other patients have thyroid condition. Is that taking a toll? Mm -hmm. You know, so some people have celiac. Is that taking a toll? So we, we just have to put it out there and uh, make the FDA aware of it, make the insurance companies aware of it so we can get the treatment that everybody with alopecia areata deserves. Absolutely. And I think that's definitely the language. <laughs> Let's put it away. It's and then if people want it, they want it. If they don't want it, yeah. they don't. I think it's always going to be... No, but it is because you're creating urgency when you're asking, is it taking a toll? You actually create an urgency on this, right? I don't think... I don't think any like i don't think this has been um uh, a thing right up until now i want to say that it hasn't have a sense of urgency because up until now it's been looked at as a cosmetic thing and we know i know you know and i know you know all my fellow other patients know that it's not a cosmetic thing it affects you way more than the way you look so what we need to do is raise that awareness that it's not just cosmetic so I really appreciate that approach of, is this really taking a toll? Because it is. And so, you know, everything are you, you're doing and, you know, all the awareness and this is why I'm doing this. And, you know, so any, anything that we can do to raise awareness that this is not just a cosmetic thing. Thank you so much for doing that. I think everybody that's doing all the other research, other amazing people are, um, just being interested and you know a lot of organization NAF, the american hair research society which has united both continents they're all trying to do even like little travel grants like just to give to the students in college and medical students to just prompt people to be like hey you know check this out learn about this a little bit more so you can help out a little bit more because the more the merrier and um you know what i think I think when we, we talk about treatment with alopecia areata, the one thing that I think bothers most people is, you know, the chase, right? Even when people get all the hair, um, the question is when, it, what, if, what happens if the medication stops? What happens when the study is over, right? Because then what happens, right? And that's what I always think about, you know, patients that have diabetes, patients that have thyroid, that's the same kind of a condition too, like what happens? And those are things that we're going to, literally figure out one day at a time. We've been very fortunate that the clinical trials that are happening with the medications, some of them have really committed. Some of the companies have committed to try to give the medication for people that want it, even after the trials are over. So I think most of the sites, especially the universities that are around the country, are fighting to get it as much as they can for patients who enter the trials and are happy with them. Um, uh, that's what I wanted to say. And then for people that don't like medications, we're trying to figure out just lifestyle things. Yeah. We know that meditation can improve it. Don't ask me how to meditate because I suck at it. <laughs> but um, we're looking at the microbiome. Everybody's looking at the microbiome. We know that people with alopecia have different microbiome than some of their age matched and like family members. So we're trying to see if we can correct microbiome them. microbiome for some people that don't know what microbiome is. So microbiome is, um, you know, we we walk around and we live we were kind of like a spaceship i guess for the lack of better words because we have like trillions of bacteria and all sorts of other things living in our gut on our skin so whether we're here for them or they're here for us but we kind of we live together we're a whole unit so the ones that live in our gut actually can affect the way the rest of our body feels so that's why we feel sometimes you know that um, there's a lot of immune cells that lie in our gut and they, they can go to your skin, they can go to your hair, they can go to your eye, cause funny diseases when they're um, non-fun, funny diseases when they're activated. So we're trying to figure out how they affect alopecia areata. A lot of my patients try, you know, the gluten-free diet. Yes. And I would say a lot, a lot of people do have sensitivities, but I haven't been able to, like nobody's really able to get more hair but it does make you feel like you have control at least a little bit right like because then when you take when you eat gluten you're like oh i can feel this so you're yeah right and you get a little bit rashy so you know it's doing something so you're trying to take care of yourself 
But interesting things came out in our several uh, reports. So as gross as this sounds, um, there are certain infections of the colon, you know, that's where the poop comes out, um, that actually um, the infections are difficult to treat. So we have these funny um, procedures, kind of like enemas or things that you get down there to get um, even pills now with poop transplant. And poop transplant is used to be taken usually from family members and kind of spun down, washed. It looks like just like a clear material at the end, and then you you get it that way to fix the infections that people had. So when they did it, in, um, the original report was in two young younger guys who had alopecia universalis for a long time, and they had poop transplants for those infections. And so it happened that they grew all of their hair, and the hair stayed. So that sparked a lot of interest. So several labs across the country. Um, in the Journal of Skin, S-K-I-N, there's actually a report from UC Irvine for a very small population just to show differences of what they are. But we haven't had studies of antibiotics or probiotics helping it out because actually in Columbia University, they're doing some antibiotic studies to see if maybe that can help that modulation. But things are yet to come out from that. And then I um, think I saw a couple of other things, even in an 80 year old gentleman who had this done and the hair just grew back from um, the poop transplant. So as gross as it sounds, think of a poop emoji, but it just tells us that when you mess with that intestinal um, bacteria that you have in there, it can go either the wrong way or the good way. And I know that like uh, some people would say, you know, I got my first hair loss after vaccine scenes which affects your immunity other people will say you know had a really bad bout of like food poisoning like when people think of things that when they can recall when they're a little bit older or like some of the episode players those are some of the things that maybe are possibly connected no and and you know it's so interesting because we haven't talked about this and everything you're saying absolutely resonates with what i've experienced myself so the moment i went gluten-free i felt better the moment i got a uh, column cleanse, I felt better. Like all those things, like I've been, you know, constipated for life. And the moment I started taking probiotics every day and really focusing on my digestion and just probiotics, 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 life changing too. Like I've had, I don't know, it's just everything you're saying resonates so much with what I'm experiencing right now. It's just, yeah, I'm mind blown. When so, I first started reading it in and- yeah, sorry, but like the no, probiotic no. thing, I just want to say it because like when people always ask me like which probiotics I should take. So it's all about like yes, please like the different numbers that are in there. Right. So even too much of the same probiotic is not a good thing. I don't know okay. if that makes any sense. So, so I'm always like try the diet routes if you can. If you take probiotics, maybe not that. I don't know, but I I went to a couple of conferences. There's a lot of very good things. Um, online, they're super scientific. I work very closely with the University of California Microbiome Project. There's this Dr. Whitteson, Karina Katrin, who's just amazing. So I'm learning a lot about it, but it just sounds like it's like a it's a perfect mix. So if you take a pill, you you can get to that level, but if you take maybe too much, you may mess it up. So we just still don't know. So there can be such a thing as like too much of a good thing. Just have one. Okay. So, but you don't know exactly because I because I've seen when I go by them, there's five, ten, five, ten, and twenty billion. Do you know? Do we know? But which depends species? which species, right? Depends which right. what which um yeah, and depends what you're missing. So I think the way things are probably gonna go with that, and do not quote me on this, anybody far from a GI expert, GI like gastrointestinal expert. But I think we're going to be able to test what we have because the way we do some of the studies, in, um, you just like literally collect a little bit of your poop and you send it into the lab. Okay. And then the lab, sorry. The, and then the lab tells you what's in there and what's not. Okay. So question, because um, I know I've heard that we're doing a lot of research right now. So if I want to participate in a research study, where do I go? So there's a site um, that ran by, in all of US, ran by the government called clinicaltrials.gov. So G-O-V, not com, G-O-V. And it's little drop down menus. So you type in alopecia areata as a condition you want to treat. Then you put the area where you are or the zip code. If you want kids or you want adults, because now there's a lot of trials for 12 and above. So the teens are doing really well. And 
Um, that way you can find. And usually if the sites get updated pretty much weekly from um, all the clinical trials. And you should say if it's active, if it has spots still open. Um, the thing with most trials is that there's limited spots per site, like 10 for 10 patients per um, site. So they get filled really quick. So people are even, for me, it's been a way, what I say to people when they debate about stuff, I'm like, you know, it's at least a good way to know if you respond to it or not, right? One of the drawbacks is that in some of the trials, you can be on a sugar pill. But then if you're not doing anything, do you waste anything? It's like a free checkup. You have a doctor that's 24-7 because all the trials have to have doctors. You get yeah. EKGs, you know all that stuff. And usually the trials that are out there that I would suggest would be phase two and above. So phase one are the ones when you kind of test them, phase two, A, B, and phase three are like the higher the number, the safer the trial, meaning we know more about the medication. So if people are more nervous to enter a phase two, A or two, B, they can wait for a phase three trial. Mm -hmm. But um, as they said, most of the medications out there right now are ones that are already either approved or very similar to approved stuff for other in for other co diseases or conditions. So I think we as the alopecia areata community have been very lucky to benefit from some of the knowledge from the other. So thanks to everybody. Yeah. And so I know you said at the beginning that the when you went to the conference, that was life-changing for you. And so I know Dory and Nav has been so generous that they're going to give us a ticket, somebody that's watching this interview right now, could be winning uh, the drawing to go to the conference in June. So what was your experience at the conference? Like what do we, why should we expect going to the conference? So um, the conference you're referring to is actually a patient conference. So it's um, the patient conference. It's a couple of hundred people with alopecia and their families under the same roof. And usually a hotel that's a fun place because there's people from like age two to age 82 or 92 maybe. Um, there are workshops every day that teach you from how you're doing, what's the diagnosis, what's the science, um, how to like wear wigs, how to draw eyebrows. There's vendors there. The kids have a kids camp. They usually bring a celebrity um, that has alopecia, um, like uh, football players or basketball players or actors for the kids to make it happy. The teens get to hang out together. Like there's stuff from like psychology to meditation to yoga. Um, it's just like a big group thing. There's a welcome dance. And then there's always the last night, like a dress up dance where everybody just gets out and has a good time. And especially for people that come in for the first time are called VIPs and it's super cute because everybody walks with these like really fun laugh uh, things and people are extra nice to VIPs, which are the first time comers. So everybody feels welcome. Then, you know, people that hide and don't feel comfortable, you see them take off their wig by the last day and people, it's, it, there's tears, there's hugs, just, it's like a big opening for the soul, for the lap. And I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it, it's, it's an intense, and I always try to bring some of my medical students with me. And there's a walk where we fundraise. So these kids, I, they, they change people afterwards. Okay. I'm so excited. I've never been. And um, I can't wait to go this summer, especially because you're going to Capitol Hill. Um, awesome. It's going to be awesome. You're going <laughs> to love it. Love it. So if you're watching this interview, make sure to enter the drawing so you can participate in the raffle to go to the conference. So thank you, Natasha, so much. Um, I would love to see you in June. And if you guys are coming to the conference, please make sure to come say hi to Natasha or me. We'll be there. <laughs> thank thank you, you for so doing this amazing doing thing. Doing You're an amazing work. woman. Amazing yeah. woman. I'm so <laughs> proud of you for doing this. This is huge. Huge. I'm, you're just amazing. You're amazing. So, well, let thanks. me tell you something. I am so glad that I that we got to meet because for me it has been. I told Dory this on her interview is that it's so amazing for me to hear that something has been done. Right for the last ten years, I've been thinking, oh, nothing has happened, nothing has changed, and listening to you guys and learning that there is things being done. It just is such a huge relief, and it gives me so much hope. So thank you so much for all your work. Love you immensely. Thank you. Bye guys. Have a good one.